Did you know that whales produce unique sounds depending on their species and can use them to communicate over large distances underwater? In this video, we're going to take a deep dive into whale vocalizations. What different whales sound like, how we can use those sounds to learn more about whales, and how the physics of sound pressure waves allows them to travel through the ocean. I'm Dr. Regina Guazzo. I'm a biological oceanographer working for the U.S. Navy in the Whale Acoustics Reconnaissance Program, or WARP, based at the Naval Information Warfare Center, or as we like to call it, NIWIC, in San Diego, California, and I'm fluent in whale. That meant I could really go for a plankton sandwich right now. No, I'm just kidding. As far as we know, whale vocalizations aren't a language quite like that. But I do know a lot about whale sounds and how we can use them to understand whale ecology. But let me back up and tell you a little bit about myself and how I became an oceanographer studying whale acoustics with the Navy. I've known since I was five years old that I wanted to be a marine biologist. When I was a kid, I spent a bunch of time at aquariums and the beach and was always fascinated by the ocean. Especially marine animals, I wanted to learn everything there was to know about them. Even when you're really into something specific, like marine biology, the awesome thing about high school is how it introduces you to new things you might also be excited about. That's where I discovered I had a passion for music. I played bass in orchestra and jazz band, and even considered becoming a professional musician when I left school. I still loved math and science classes, but I wasn't sure if there was a realistic pathway for me to a career in marine biology. But in college at Rutgers University, I discovered a marine science major, which introduced me to the field of bioacoustics. I even got to do an internship at Duke University in North Carolina for a summer, studying bottlenose dolphin whistles. After graduating from college, I moved from New Jersey to California to start the PhD program at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And the Navy gave me my next big break with their smart scholarship. And would you believe it? By focusing on underwater acoustics, I found a way to work my musical background in two with the help of computers. I'll be honest, I wasn't the biggest fan of computer programming in high school and college. At one point, I even said I hated it and I never wanted to do it again. But now I really enjoy it because through computer programming, we are able to process and analyze tons of whale songs. Learning to speak whale has allowed me to find an amazing career that combines my passions for music and marine ecology into doing unique science in the ocean using acoustics. Let me tell you a little bit more about our specific work in the Warp Lab. Nearby is Niwak Pacific in San Diego, one of several Navy facilities around the United States where researchers study marine mammals. My laboratory focuses on what we call basic research, learning more about the fundamental nature and behavior of whales and dolphins, such as where they go and what they do. Some of these mammals migrate long distances through the ocean and others dive down to deep depths. And there's still so much we don't know about them. But by listening to the sounds they make, we can learn more including identifying species and tracking their movements. Even though we're here in San Diego, modern technology lets us gather, share, and process data from remote locations. So right now, we're studying whales in a tiny area of the North Pacific near some islands, thousands of miles across the ocean from here, all the way over where some of us humans like to vacation as well, Hawaii. Part of our team captures underwater recordings from around the Aloha State and sends them here to us, where our local team of scientists, engineers, technicians, and data analysts work on sorting out which parts are whale vocalizations. 
because these are very, very long sound recordings we're talking about, there is a huge amount of data to crunch through. It takes a lot of people working together. We couldn't do what we do without this highly talented team. What we're essentially trying to do is use the whale sounds to try and understand more about the lives of the animals. Light doesn't travel well underwater, so whales rely on sound to communicate and sense their environment. When we listen to these sounds, they can tell us what species are out there, what the animals are doing, and how their behavior changes in response to our activities. How do we get these recordings in the first place? We use a special kind of microphone designed to be used underwater called a hydrophone. These hydrophones can sense small fluctuations in pressure, which is how sound travels. With a single hydrophone, we can get recordings that, in a way, help us learn the language. By making a catalog of different vocalizations, we can learn to recognize different species of whales and make hypotheses about what the whales are doing. For example, finding food or looking for a mate. And if we record the sounds on multiple hydrophones, we can actually locate and track the whales as they move through the ocean. How does this tracking work? Well, we know the speed that sound moves through the water. So if we have a network of hydrophones all synchronized and recording at once, and they capture a whale sound, we can use the difference in the time that particular sound arrives at multiple individual hydrophones to estimate the location of the animal that produced it. Of course, there's far too much data for a person to listen to every recording and pick out each whale noise and do those calculations by hand. That's why we have to program computers to help us. I bet you're curious about what all these different whale vocalizations sound like. The first thing you need to know is that there are two basic types of whales. Baleen whales, which feed by filtering small animals out of the water using thick hair-like plates in the whale's mouths. And tooth whales, which eat using their teeth. Baleen whales tend to make low-pitched groaning sounds, like this call from a gray whale. Toothed whales make more high-pitched whistles and clicks, like these vocalizations from common dolphins. Some of the sounds whales make are songs. As far as we know, only males sing, and they sing more often in the winter during mating season. So we hear those songs from baleen whales more in warmer waters, since that's where many of them like to spend the winter. And songs are repeated, whereas calls, like those that might be associated with feeding, are more scattered in time. Here is an example of a segment from a humpback whale song. Some toothed species, like dolphins, produce sounds like clicks to locate things, especially food, from the echoes of the sound that bounce off fish or other objects. But there's no evidence that baleen whales do this. Speaking of evidence, get ready for a surprise. We don't actually completely understand how whales make sound at all. When we humans talk, we move air over our vocal cords as we exhale, but whales are somehow able to make sound while they're under the water without breathing out. And we're still not sure exactly how. Questions like these are why we still need to do a lot of basic research. There's a lot we still don't know in this field that we call bioacoustics, and we need science, math, and computing skills to help figure it out and communication skills to make sure people learn about the cool things we've discovered. Technology has already helped us make great strides in bioacoustics over the last 20 years with better recording ability, data processing, and visualization. One way we visualize sound is with something called a spectrogram. 
A spectrogram is a colorful graph that shows time on the x-axis and frequency on the y-axis. The colors indicate the intensity of the sound. Here's an example of a spectrogram of sperm whale echolocation clicks. It sounds like this. And here's one of a fin whale song that sounds like this. Want to give it a try? Can you guess which spectrogram goes with this minky whale boing call? Did you figure out the right one? I mentioned that the y-axis of these spectrograms shows the frequency content of the calls. So let me back up a bit to explain a little more about the physics of sound. Sound is made up of pressure waves. We can graphically plot pressure versus time of a continuous tone, and it looks like this. Mathematically, there are three quantities that describe a wave. The height from a wave's rest position to its peak or trough is called the amplitude. The number of waves that pass by in a given time is called the frequency. And the distance in space from one peak to another is called the wavelength. Since the speed of the sound waves does not change much underwater, then the wavelength and the frequency are related in a mathematical inverse relationship. Wavelength is equal to the speed divided by the frequency. So, the smaller the wavelength, the higher the frequency, and the lower the frequency, the longer the wavelength. The wavelength is important because it affects the distance that the sound can travel. We'll get more into that in a little bit. Sound waves don't go up and down like water waves, though. Sound waves are composed of alternating regions of pressure. With sound, the amplitude is how much the pressure increases from when there was no sound. Our brains perceive higher amplitude sounds as louder and lower amplitude sounds as quieter. And as frequency increases and our ears receive more cycles of sound waves in a given time, our brain perceives the sound as higher pitched. But at some point, our ears can no longer sense higher frequency sound and we hear nothing at all. But some whales can hear much higher frequencies than us. These sound pressure waves are produced by organs or objects like musical instruments vibrating. When a musical instrument vibrates, it sends these oscillating pressure waves through the air. As a general rule, the bigger the instrument, the lower the frequency. A larger instrument, like a bass, takes longer to vibrate back and forth because there's more of it to move, so it makes a lower pitch sound. My friend, Dr. Alyssa Agamondo, who studies the hearing and echolocation abilities of dolphins, plays a much smaller instrument, the clarinet, which produces higher pitches. In a similar way, larger whales tend to produce lower frequency sounds, and smaller whales tend to produce higher frequency sounds. A blue whale, which is the largest animal to ever exist, with a maximum length of 110 feet, is more like a bass. And the smaller killer whale, or orca, with a maximum length of about 32 feet, is more like a clarinet. <coughs> Thanks, Alyssa. But there's another aspect of physics to be aware of with sound waves. The speed of sound isn't always the same. It depends on what the sound is going through. Because the sound wave has to move the particles of the material it's traveling through, sound travels through 
different matter at different speeds depending on the density of that matter. Sound travels much faster in water than it does in air, about four and a half times as fast. It also travels farther because the particles in water are more closely packed than in air, so it's more efficient for the compression wave to propagate through them. These are the reasons whales use sound to communicate over long distances. It can be hard to imagine how far sound can travel underwater. If you're trying to get your friend's attention, it can be hard for them to understand you from the other side of the sports field. But underwater, whale calls can travel for 10, 50, or 100 miles or more. In fact, a famous experiment was done in 1991 that showed that intense, low-frequency sounds produced in the southern Indian Ocean could be detected all over the world. Lower frequency sounds also tend to travel farther underwater than higher frequency sounds. Kind of like how if you're walking down the street towards a rockin' party, you can hear the low-pitched oons oons of the bass beat from a block away, but you can't hear the high-pitched guitar and singing until you get right next door to it. See if you can figure out why. Think about how the difference in wavelengths corresponding to those frequencies might be related to the size of the objects between you and the sound source. But the whale-related point is, the large baleen whales often appear to us to be quite solitary. But that's because they can send their low frequency calls over extremely long distances to communicate with each other. So they don't need to stay as close together. Whereas marine mammals that use high frequency sounds to communicate need to be closer together physically, which is one reason why you'll often see them in groups. I always laugh when people ask me if I speak whale, but now you'll be able to say that you speak a little whale yourself. Although as a musician, maybe it's somehow more appropriate to say I appreciate all forms of whale music. There's so much we can learn from it, and it is so thrilling to me that I've been able to combine my high school passions of marine biology, physics, math, and music into a career that lets me contribute to our knowledge of these graceful ocean giants. And there still is a lot that needs to be filled in, so we need people like you to ask questions and try to find the answers to them. We're fortunate that the Navy employs researchers to study these marine environments and the creatures in them to ensure that we can all coexist in harmony. So if you have interests that don't seem related, keep looking and listening. When you hear the call that combines them, you never know, it might be a whale speaking.